before I do, I will give a brief intro about who she is. Uh, Maggie is an Anglican priest and the rector of the Church of St. Stephen in the Fields near Kensington Market in downtown Toronto. She is also the chair of the Social Justice and Advocacy Committee of the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. She has worked with a variety of human rights and social justice organizations and has also published three novels and several books of poetry. Please a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have no history with IDI or York University, so it's very exciting to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. It is really very tempting just to say um, everything Dr. Goldberg said, that's good, and sit down. Uh, I, I think that would actually cover, cover the bases really quite adequately, and of course the the text that she read from Isaiah and spoke about is also a sacred text in my tradition, and one which I, I love very much um, and, and have been very much influenced by. But I will, I will do my best to talk about, about this issue from a Christian perspective, which is difficult among other reasons because there is no one Christian perspective. Um, Christianity is a big complicated animal with many, many different branches and practices. Um, there is nothing I can say about the Christian practice of fasting which someone can't get up and say that's not true. Um, although I think it is in general fair to say that Christians do not take the traditional practice of fasting nearly as seriously as we used to or as we should. And that is something that we can learn particularly from our Muslim brothers and sisters and the, the seriousness with which Ramadan is observed. Um, there are many designated fast times and days in the Christian tradition. Um, the longest and most serious is the period of Lent, which is 40 days leading up to Easter. Uh, there is a four-week fasting period, Advent, leading up to Christmas. There are a number of days designated throughout the year as fast days, and also every Wednesday and every Friday is supposed to be a fast day. You would be very, very hard put to find Christians outside, perhaps some monks and nuns, who observe all of these, all of these fasting rules. Most people will do something during Lent, maybe give up chocolate. Um, there are many traditional rules around how fasting is to be structured. The Eastern Orthodox Church takes it more seriously than the Western churches and observes the, the, the great fasts and the little fasts uh, quite, quite seriously, often more in terms of abstaining from particular types of food, um, no meat, no butter, no oil, no fish with spines, um, and limiting the amount of food rather than a kind of a more time-based restriction. But it, it's very variable in practice. Um, but as, as Dr. Goldberg very rightly observed, fasting in and of itself is not the point. Fasting in and of itself is an empty gesture, and you also find statements of Jesus in the Christian scriptures saying the same thing. Um, going around going, look at me, I'm fasting. I'm so awesome, I'm fasting. Um, it doesn't really accomplish much. Um, the purpose of fasting, I think, can be a subtle and complicated one. We fast in part not because food is bad, or our bodies are bad, or the material world is bad, because they are good. Because fasting reminds us that we are given all these things as a pure gift from God. That we are contingent, we are vulnerable, we are needy, and that everything we have we have received as gift. And because we have received it as gift, 
we have no right to cling to it when others are in need. You'll find many, many teachings in the early church that will say if you, if you have more than you need and your neighbor is hungry, that is theft, you are living in a state of sin. We are to have enough. And if we could all in this world be satisfied with enough, then there would be enough for everyone. The reason that there is not enough for everyone is because some of us have much, much more than we need. Fasting observed in the right way, I hope, could be a discipline that can teach us what is enough. What do we really need, rather than how much can we have, which seems to be the measure in most of our contemporary societies. So that's a few reflections. I'd like to try to do a little bit of storytelling from my tradition and maybe look at, at three stories from the, the larger story that the Christian faith is built on and see what, what we might draw from that, because I like to think and talk in terms of story. The first story, um, there are in the Christian tradition four Gospels. They don't agree on very much. Uh, two of them include the story that says, no, three of them, in different ways have the story that says that Jesus, uh, before he began his public ministry, before he went out into the world to teach, went into the wilderness for 40 days to fast. That that was his, his preparation for moving into his public ministry. And two of the Gospels say that at the end of that period of fasting, he was tempted by Satan what we believe we're talking about when we say Satan is going to be different from person to person, but in, in terms of the story, it's a powerful story. So he was tempted by Satan, and the first temptation which was offered to him was to turn stones to bread to satisfy his hunger. And he refused to do that. And he was also offered by Satan power over all the kingdoms of the world. And the final temptation, or the second of three, depending which, which gospel you're reading, they come in different orders, was to throw himself off the temple and see if God would rescue him, really to, to, test, to test God's loyalty. But I'm, I'm really interested in the temptation to turn stones to bread because that would seem like not a bad thing. Satan is not saying, you know, I'm gonna give you a, a, a gigantic banquet. He's not saying I'm gonna take food away from these poor people and give it to you. But it's an it would be an exercise of power for his own benefit and his own benefit only because he's alone there in the wilderness. Satan doesn't seem to be especially hungry. Um, <coughs> And so part of what we can take from that is that food and hunger are community issues. They are not issues we are meant to deal with as isolated individuals. We are not meant to employ our power to feed ourselves without thinking about people around us, without thinking about community, without thinking about society. You cannot pull food and hunger out of a social context and make it an individual thing. You're hungry, you want food, you want a car, you want whatever. What other people want or need doesn't matter. So that's the first story. And there are two other stories that I think echo that in a really interesting way. And one of the reasons I think this is the most interesting of the temptations is it in a way it returns, but in different forms. The second story, and this is one of the very, very few stories that is told in all four of our Gospels, is about the feeding of the hungry multitude. Jesus is, is surrounded by a crowd of people, and once again, they're out in the desert, they're out in the wilderness, um, and these people are hungry. And there's, there's huge numbers of them, 4,000, 5,000. And the disciples come to him and say, 
uh, look at all these people, they're all gonna start fainting from hunger, we don't wanna deal with this. Send them off to buy food. Throw them onto the mercy of the free market, effectively. Let them go out there and trade whatever resources they have for whatever food they can eat. It's not our problem. And Jesus says, no, no, I want you to give them something to eat. They're pretty confounded by this, as they would be. They have apparently, depending on the account, they have a little bit of bread with them or they have nothing at all. And Jesus is telling them, well, you know what? You give 5,000 people something to eat. I think that's your job right now. And somehow it happens. In the stories in which they have no bread, someone comes to them. It might be a boy, it might be a slave. Translation's not clear. And, and offers them some bread. And in all the versions of the story, this small amount of bread is taken, it's blessed. It's shared, and in the sharing, there is enough for everyone. Everyone has enough. And at the end, the fragments are all gathered up so that nothing is lost, nothing is wasted. And there's a vision there, just a brief flash of a vision of community, of society, of human life as it is meant to be lived in sharing, lived in enough, enough for everyone, and the fragments gathered up so that nothing is wasted and nothing is lost. There's no excess. It's about everyone being fed together. And the other message of this, of course, is that if we Christians consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus, it is, in fact, our job to get out there and give them something to eat. That's, that's what he told us to do, and that's what we best get on with doing, with reshaping our society into that vision, into that society in which there is sharing and there is enough, and no one goes away hungry, and nothing is wasted, and nothing is thrown away at the end. And the final story, which is powerfully important in the the Catholic tradition of Christianity, which I consider myself as an Anglican to belong, which is on his final night with his disciples, before the Romans take him and execute him, they have a meal together. And Jesus takes the bread and says, this bread is my body. And he breaks it and he gives it to the disciples. And I think part of what he's saying here, I mean, it's a strange cryptic statement and the church has fought for many centuries over exactly what it means. But part of what he's saying here is that this is how God comes to us in ordinary food, bread, the most basic kind of food shared, broken and shared in community. This is how we experience God now. This is how we encounter God now. And this is what we're meant to live out now. One of my favorite preachers who was in the uh, 16th century, a man named Lancelot Andrews, magnificent name, wonderful preacher, talks about how communion the, the receiving of the bread and wine in a Christian service, which is a, the, the most important part of a, a Christian service in the Catholic tradition, is not complete until we ourselves become bread broken for the poor. That's what we are meant to be and that's what we are meant to do to offer our lives, ourselves, our resources to our brothers and sisters because we are all one body, and we are all one bread, and we are all meant to live in this community of sharing, and this community of enough. And I think there are many ways to do that. There are food programs and food banks, but more importantly, there are the attempts by 
people of faith and by our secular partners to, to create a better society and to shape ourselves into people who live in enough rather than in, in constant accumulation, in community rather than in isolation, rather than in the, the trap of the individual ego. And I would like to think that, that fasting properly practiced can help us in that training and can reinforce us and drive us in our work for justice in the world and for the creation of human society as it is meant to be. Thank you.